Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. It's a joy to be worshiping with you this morning on this odd weather day, but especially it's a joy to be worshiping with you on this Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you who are mothers and uh, welcome. Welcome online to those of you joining us and again to those in person. I'm Pastor Todd Johnson here at Hope. We are a growing gospel saturated community. But that means because gospel means good news, there is good news about what God is doing in our world. There is good news about what he does today in our hearts and lives. There is good news that gives us hope. And so we named ourselves Hope because we are a community finding our hope in Jesus and extending that hope to others. And so it is this day that we gather for worship to reset ourselves on the great hope of what Jesus has done. I do remind you that this is our first day with the kind of upgraded mask policy, and that is you are welcome if you are fully vaccinated to take your masks off, except when singing before, after the service, and when singing. If you're not vaccinated, we strongly recommend that you keep your masks on, but uh, you are free, obviously, to take your masks off when uh, at all other times, except when singing now during the service. Okay? But we've gathered to worship. We come to worship and God is the initiator. God is the one that calls us. And so we use his word right now to call us. So please stand with me as we enter his presence together for this call to worship from Psalm 30. Oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. Oh, Lord, you have brought up my soul from the grave. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. You, Lord, have turned for me my morning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Join me in prayer. O oh Lord, how can we be silent? How can we be silent for you? We will and should and ought give thanks to you forever, but it is not only an ought and a should, it is the desire of our hearts when we see your grandeur, when we see your holiness. We do praise you still, even when dark times come and when the morning comes. We give you glory, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for you are worthy. We bring our whole beings to you, Lord, to engage with you, for you have called us to yourself. We adore you. Our almighty God, hear our praise we ask. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing.
now give our attention to the reading of God's word, and for that we go online to Norma. This morning's Old Testament reading is from Zechariah 2, 10 to 13. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. For many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, O flesh, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The nations come to the Lord that they may know him. We know that our God is holy and that he's, that's this ends. He's, he's in his holy dwelling. And yet in the good news of Jesus grace, we find out that our God is not just holy. He is a debt canceling God. We don't need to hide from him. We don't need to pretend. We don't have to fake a good Christian life. We can be honest and he meets us and receives us with grace. And so it is in light of that, that God's people every week confess their sin because they long to know this great debt canceling God and be honest about who they are crying out for gracious change. So join me. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rules in our life. We have gone along with the way of the world to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people. Hear our silent prayers now, Lord. Canceling God didn't just wave a magic wand. He came and shed his blood that we might have life. That is the depth of his love and grace for us. Here are these words of comfort and assurance from Romans 3, not from Isaiah, but first our common call and response. Brothers and sisters, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We are brothers and sisters through his blood. We have died together. We will rise together. We will live together. And now from Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus. I forgot to stand you. Thank you. I invite you to stand in here now. Think about that good news. Freely by his grace justified. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And in light of that, we have peace with God and one another. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Greet one another, saying, the peace of the Lord be with you, and replying, and also with you. Peace be with you. <laughs> Okay, I 
and offerings, but I, uh, we, we obviously are doing a no-touch service at many levels, and so we're not passing the plates. There is a bin you can put uh, an offering in, or you can especially give online the safest way to do it in this season, um, but as is our custom, we want to offer ourselves. We've been doing that all through the pandemic with various prayers or prayer songs. We have this one uh, for our Easter season. Did we lose power? Interesting. Got it? All right. Join me in singing this prayer song. going on in, in the life of our family, uh, there are not many to announce. I just remind you that uh, next week, third through fifth graders, we've got breakout. So look for that email coming, you third through fifth graders, uh, from me to your parents. Well, I guess your parents have to look for that email, but we will be meeting immediately after the service next week. Um, small groups, because it's Mother's Day, are on hiatus today, uh, as well as, um, yeah, or, or on hiatus, or taking a break. Other than that, I don't think there's anything I need to highlight. Did I miss anything? We continue to have our Intro to Hope class last one Friday night. Join us 
but that's it. So um, let's continue in our next movement to prayers of the people. This is a day, if you've noticed, that we uh, think about the good news going out, going to the nations. We're going to look at what's called the Great Commission. In light of that, I want us to pray for our mission. I'm going to start, I've, I've already talked to Laura and to Mark to pray. I'm going to uh, pray for uh, just a Mother's Day prayer, because it is Mother's Day, and we value you. We salute you. <laughs> it's a tiring job, and, and we want to pray uh, for moms. But then Laura's going to pray, as you noticed on our Friday email. If you don't get our update email, let me know. I can add you to that list. Um, but we got a newsletter from RUF at JMU. And so we support our RUF ministries and our presbytery. That is Reformed University Fellowship, knowing that so many students, so many humans place their faith in Christ before they're 21. We want them to be great resources on that campus as they see things. So Laura's going to pray for RUF and JMU. And then Mark is going to pray for our work around the world for missionaries, especially we've uh, joined in projects in Haiti and in uh, Nicaragua. And so... They're going to come up and lead that, but join me as we do prayers to the people this way this morning. Dear Father, we approach your throne of grace. Your throne where you have all authority and you are making all things new. And so we come with longings in our hearts. I just even think that when we bowed here to prayer, there are things probably distracting some of us. We offer those things to you. There are things we're aware of and care about that are not yet the way they ought to be we lift those up to you but lord especially on this mother's day we're grateful for our mothers we're grateful for the mothers in our midst who do labor so tirelessly who so beautifully and eloquently display your love your commitment to precious little ones or to grown adult children, would you please bless our mothers, give them strength, give them wisdom. We've been reading in 1 Corinthians, this wisdom that comes from you, would you please endow all of us, but we do especially pray for mothers this day, that they would know you and that it would overflow to the little ones or the big ones that they shepherd. Give them strength as we've asked. We do, Lord, especially pray for moms in our community, those that are struggling in our church and outside of our church, those that feel hopeless, those that wonder how they can wake up and parent another day. Would you be kind and meet them, especially with your good news of hope? We pray for single moms who learn how to parent solely without the help and how tired. I can't imagine it, Father. So would you please, as you are a father to the fatherless, be a helper and a guide and a sustainer, especially to single moms. And then, Lord, we especially think of orphans in our midst who have no mother, those in foster care. Would you please strengthen and work for them, would they know the motherly love that you have by your grace, please? We ask too, Lord, for those who in this day of Mother's Day, there are pangs of grief. Those who have had mothers, maybe even this year, especially in the year of COVID, we pray for those who have lost mothers. And this Mother's Day brings this pinch that we aren't home yet. Would you please comfort in grief? And we do also, of course, Lord, pray for those who have never had the honor of bearing children and bear that unique grief. Would you meet them? Would you please continue to be their lover and comfort and purpose giver? May their nurturing extend to neighbor, to those in need. As you meet them, we ask. And I pray all these things in your precious name. Lord Jesus, we give you praise and thanks, along with Joe Slater and his wife, for the ministry that you have supported and sustained this year. We, we thank
thank you, Lord, that you have done what would have seemed impossible, and that is that you have given them their largest freshman class in history in the midst of all these lockdowns and restrictions. Thank you for raising up these leaders who will take the ministry into the next four years. Um, Father, we pray for the unique ministry that they have, partnering with the local church to tutor the children of refugees and immigrants in the area. Thank you that a third of their of the RUF ministry um, are volunteering to do that in the community. And we do pray that that would lead to wonderful partnerships and great flourishing of your people in Harrisonburg. And Lord, we pray that as the semester has come to an end and for many RUF campus ministers, they have been sprinting and now they have a moment perhaps to rest. Would you refresh them physically, emotionally, spiritually? Would you bring in the necessary funds to bolster their accounts that they might may know no limits in terms of what they dream for that you might do in the in the coming year thank you jesus for the way you're displaying yourself on the campus of jmu through this ministry and heavenly father as we uh, are preparing to listen to this sermon that todd's going to share with us about the great commission and how you have said to your disciples that they should be witnesses to you both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And we think specifically about uh, Bruce and Deb Robinson who are working in Haiti and Charles Kay and his wife who are working in Nicaragua. They don't have nearly the resources that we do. The people are in uh, often desperate circumstances. The ones in Haiti often don't have water, which is what Deb and Bruce are working to give them clean and fresh water. But in this time of COVID, they don't have vaccinations. They don't have as much uh, resources. They don't have hope often. And so we would ask that you would help us to remember to support these uh, works overseas that are in your name, where we are giving cups of cold water to those in the name of Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. 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 We now go back to Norma for our New Testament reading. The New Testament reading this morning is from Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join us as we pray this song. years ago, uh, we decided we needed a new kitchen table. Our girls were leaving. Remember, we don't call it empty nest. We call it th phase three. We're now learning to parent with adult children out of the house. After we, anyway. we needed a table, and so we found a great one, this oak table on Craigslist, and it was a good price, and we, we got it. It was, it was great. The, there was only, the great advantage of it was it had like it, it expands so that it can be a little small round table that's just Laura and myself, or it has three big leafs and we can see like 10 people around it if you cram in. 
And so it was great, but th there were some problems. One being, I said oak, and it was a 1970s table, so for those of you that know, that means it was like a bright orange, right? Or like this weird oaky kind of thing. And that, it doesn't really fit our decor. The other was, it had been used, we got on Craigslist cheap because it was from college students or some grad students. And they had used it for their projects and it was covered with, with paint and all these things. And um, thank you for catching, the wind has now picked up for us. Um, it needed to be refinished sanded down, stripped, and Laura had it in our garage for months doing work on this, right? Make, stripping it down, sanding it, and then she uh, put polyurethane and put uh, stain on it, and it's a beautiful table in our dining room. It, she restored it, and it's beautiful. Doesn't it feel good to restore something? Doesn't it feel good? It's like humans were made to be restorers. Now, in case you're hearing this and you're going like, I'm not handy, I don't like doing things like tables. Th we don't think this way, but, but consider, what are you doing, kids, every time you shower? I'm obeying my parents. No, you're restoring yourself to health. Doesn't it just feel better after a long day or after exercise to get all the grime off sometimes and to, it just, you're restoring. I, you know, we, again, we don't. This is kind of odd, but you you put food in the microwave. Why? To restore it to good use. It, it to to make it healthy again, to make it palatable or beautiful to your appetite. You might say, you do laundry to restore it. You know, list could go on. We are by nature restorers. I'm starting here because of our passage. It's called the Great Commission, and we, we know that not everyone who's joining with us comes from a church or religious background, but if you do, you've heard this before. You know it. It's a co-mission, and even as I studied and read and listened to some other people this week, people talked about our duty and our assignments. Kids, I have a question. When your teacher gives you an assignment, do you go, oh, goody, I want to finish this? Or don't you go, okay, it's my duty to do this. You, you see, our attitude, our understanding of who we are as humans needs to inform this passage. Is this a duty I have, or is it actually fulfilling some of my deepest longings? That there's like a tune in my heart that sings with this very passage of being a restorer. That's what I submit to you today that this passage is tapping into a tune in our heart that we actually want to sing along with it. You want to sing along with it. And we've unfortunately beat each other up over the heads with it instead and made it duty. And so that's what we want to consider today. What, what if this passage actually resonates with our deepest longings? And so to consider things, I want us to, I'm, I'm going to have four points, which I am aware I usually only have two, so I'm going to move fast. Though, unfortunately, my battery just died on this, so we're going to move fast. Sorry, I probably wasn't supposed to say that, was I? That's not helpful. We're going to talk about four things. It's an invitation in this passage, an invitation to realize, to, deep, uh, to, realize, to join, to spread, and to deepen. To realize, to join, to spread, and to deepen. First, to realize. Verse 18 of the Great Commission. There's so much here, we're not gonna be able to talk about everything. It would be helpful if I had it open in front of me, wouldn't it? <laughs> all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority. Why does Jesus need to say that? He's God. God has all authority. Just read your Old Testament. It's reminding us all the time. God has control, he has power, he is able, and he is loving and good to accomplish it. So why does Jesus need to say this? And Sinclair Ferguson, who I was looking at this week, listening to, helped out a lot, that he says this, when Jesus says this, he is not so much speaking about his divinity as he is about his humanity. His humanity, why? Think about the big honking story of scripture. Right? We at this church talk about a four chapter gospel, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, with four relationships. 
that God has made us for himself to relate to ourselves, to relate to one another, and to relate to his world. Well, just think about chapter one in the garden, in creation. What was true of men and women, of humankind? We had authority. We had authority. What's the first thing you see Adam do? He names the animals. And if you know your Old Testament, to name something in the Old Testament meant you had a right and a power and the ability to do it. You had authority over it. And so humans were to help animals flourish. It was a sign that we had this authority over them, this power, this goodness that we could bring to bear on them. Sorry, let me fix my wind-blown notes. We had this dominion, is the way Genesis 1 and 2 would talk about it. This dominion, authority. But it wasn't just the animal, it was animals, it was the ground, right? God says in Genesis 2 to men and women, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, but their calling as gardeners, that's the main calling, to be these, these tillers and nurturers of life was that from the garden, God's glory, goodness, beauty, and creation would expand to fill everything in goodness. It was that ground would be covered with the goodness of God because they were to be his image bearers, taking out his goodness to all of creation. But what happened? They rebelled. And we enter the second chapter of our two chap of our four chapter gospel. They disobeyed God. They rejected his authority, and as a result, everything broke. Their relationship with God broke, their relationship with themselves became ruptured and were filled with shame. Their relationship with one another became one of violence and hatred. There was even murder, and their relationship to this ground that they had dominion over is now filled with thorns, thistles, frustration. In our bentness, there no longer was an ability to be able to do rightly and fully what God had asked us to do, to be his multipliers to the whole world. And yet here, Jesus has come. And he has lived the perfect life of the second Adam, and he has died for all that is broken. He had lived the perfect life and fulfilled all that was required, but then he satisfied our debt and rose from the dead, breaking the curse of all this that had lost us authority. And so again, I mentioned Sinclair Ferguson. I have a long quote from him here. He says this, so when Jesus says all authority is given to me, he is really summarizing everything he came to do. He is telling his disciples that he has been obedient to the heavenly father where Adam was disobedient. And we likewise have been disobedient. He's saying that he has won the victory over the powers of darkness that ensnared our parents, that he has conquered through his sacrifice and given to the Heavenly Father that he has come to redeem sinners, to bring them back to God. And on the Christ, on the cross, he would cry, cry out, Father, I've done it. And then Sinclair Ferguson said, that's what Adam and Eve were supposed to say as image-bearing authoritative humans. They were supposed to take this idea of flourishing the goodness of God and to come and say, okay, Father, we've done it. But they couldn't. And now Jesus does. And he's conquered and he sits in authority. This restoration of not just me and my sins, but of all things, of the great second Adam coming and starting a whole new creation that we get to be a part of, that he invites us into. It's why there's many places we could go, but Ephesians 1 says this. God's great power worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body. And so the second Adam has come. We realize that all rivals that had destroyed mankind 
are now vanquished. All rivals that had destroyed mankind are now vanquished because a man had perfectly obeyed. And authority is given to him. This is an invitation to realize maybe for the first time, maybe for the millionth time as we need to hear this good news again and again, <laughs> that Jesus has done it. That Jesus has all authority. That Jesus has fulfilled all that we could not as men and women. And that Jesus invites us into this rescue plan. Because see, we want to hear, no, we hear every day the idea that, well, chaos reigns, doesn't it? Evil reigns, doesn't it? Sin seems more real and authoritative in my life. Do you see what I mean? The, the chaos seems like it carries more authority than the word of God. And Jesus says it's alive from the pit of hell and it smells like smoke. And it's a lie that can only be spoken through the gasping breath because Satan is vanquished. And so it's an invitation to realize the work of what Jesus has done. It's an invitation to join. It's an invitation, secondly, not just to realize, but to join. All authority has been given to me, therefore go. It's a command so you don't have a you in there, but it goes to you. <laughs> join. This is, as I've said before, the Flanders Field. That is, if you know that classic poem from World War I, John McRae had just, he was a Canadian physician laboring in World War I, and he had just laid one of his good friends into a grave with poppies around it, and hear, hearing the gunfire, knowing he'll be back into the operating room and then back at this graveyard again, he wrote this. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. And then he writes it from the perspective of, the, of his friend. We are the dead short, short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow. Loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel against the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. The torch here from the dead to life is being passed. But as we just saw, the resurrected Lord of life passes the torch to us now as men and women, to his disciples and through them to the church, that he throws, life comes to death, that we pick up life, the torch of life to carry. You see, this is a reinstatement or a, really an explosion with more of the cultural mandate. That's again going back to Genesis 1 and 2. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Men you are, and women, you are to be my co-regents is a term we use. We were his image bearers, which is what a king would set up a statue in different cities because he couldn't put a picture or a, um, or a television screen at that time. We were to be God's statues. But what's Jesus saying? From me to you now. You are restored now to be my co-regents, to take my rule and reign. We are, I have worked this great restoration and you are now into the agency of making beauty. You see, this makes sense too. When you think of New Testament language, Paul, well, so many authors, Jesus talked about being one with his disciples. This phrase is used of union with Christ. Union with Christ, that we are made one. When you come to faith in Christ, you are united to him so that his work becomes your work, so that his, for, the, the forgiveness he made, is, it, it becomes yours. His perfection becomes yours. His mission becomes yours. Not that you work it up, but out of union. It is true of who we become as restored sons of Adam and Eve, united to the one who is the great missionary. Remember, who is the missionary? We talked about this, I think, Friday night at our Intro to Hope class. 
famous verse in the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that he sent his son. God is a sending God. He says, go to his disciples, but he... matters. Kids, sorry, doing your homework matters as you bring God's good rule to bear on what is in front of you. Going to Haiti matters too, but there's a joining in that even a church in Crozet is to have. Yes, talking to our neighbors, but also dealing with our dishes. We make, we do all things to the glory of God, right? We make food, okay. Invitation to realize, to join, thirdly, to spread. Go therefore, make disciples as co-laborers with God and as co-regents. Remember that, let's do the story again. In Genesis one and two, be fruitful and multiply, rule over the animals. Who was not in that mandate? Other men and women. It didn't need to be. There was no sick. So men and women were to multiply these image bearers who did not have sin and to take over. But what is true now? There is rebellion. There is disbelief. There is doubt. And so now God says spread, not just to all of creation, but to other humans, this mandate to bring my rule, my kind benevolence and love to hearts. And, and it's easy to miss the flip that's happening here. Again, some of us have heard this so often that you know this, but this is in Matthew, right? 28. In Matthew 10, Jesus sends out the 12, and you know what he says to them? These 12 Jesus sent out, this is verse 5 of Matthew 10, instructing them, go. But then he says this, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans but rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Do you see how this verse then is to go? Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations. Join with me to all mankind. Because what kind of restoration does Jesus bring? It's not just this little part or that little part. And you need to know that because it is not just the life of the really holy and spiritual. It's your life too. But... Here, again, think of the whole story. In Genesis 10, nations are introduced. As you think of the big story of what God's doing. It's called the table of nations. All these people. But then what happens in chapter 11? If you read your Bible, it is called the Tower of Babel. And the nations, instead of spreading out to cover the earth, they say, no, let's just settle down here and build a tower and try and work our way to God and see if we can force an audience with him on our ziggurat that we're building. And God comes and loves and says, no, I want to spread you back out so that you can at least be my broken image bearers. But what happens soon after Jesus rises? We're not going to look at that in the series. In Acts 2, the spirit comes down and nations, tongues start being spoken, other languages to declare his glory. It is the reversal 
of the Tower of Babel. That is the rescue that Jesus is bringing. That this whole story where nations have lived in rebellion, read your Old Testament. It talks about nations against God, nations against his chosen people, nations that he must judge. Now God says, go, spread to the nations, bring my kind rule and reign to those who have not heard. And so as you may know, this day, there are more Presbyterians worshiping in Korea than there are in Scotland, where Presbyterianism started, and America combined. This day, there are more Episcopalians or Anglicans worshiping in Nigeria than there are in England, where it started, plus everyone in America. God has moved from the majority world, or he's moved into the majority world. He has moved to the nations. And so we are to spread out to neighbor and to nations in kindness and in love. I, uh, we had a, a daughter, uh, we have a daughter, we have three. Um, our middle daughter, when we first went to Great Wolf Lodge, those are kids, do you like Great Wolf Lodge? Love, great, I, I love water park. Yeah, t- dads, do you love great? Um, you know, uh, there's that time where the, the big bucket they have is slowly filling, is slowly filling, and then it, it, it starts ringing a bell, dong, 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 and Kate would, we'd be sitting there, we were trying to get ready, I forget, maybe to have lunch or something, and we were trying to tell her, but we started hearing the dong, and she just goes, wait, gotta go, and she ran and got under it right away, and then a thousand gallons came pouring out on her, you know, and it, Here's my point. What, what is happening there? There's been this time of water going in, of water going in, of water filling, and then there comes a break point where it spills out in blessing on my daughter. That's our calling. Jesus has poured his rescue, his grace, his goodness, his love. It is to pour out, to spread to neighbor and nation. Well, to realize to join, to spread, and then finally, to deepen. I end with deepen because if we don't have deepen, this really is just duty. Baptize, there's so much we're skipping here, but baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For those who have been raised in a Christian uh, influenced area like we have, we again hear these things and go, yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Think about the watershed, I used to water again, issue that's going on here. Here, Here's my Matthew 28. This entire section, if you were to call out to God, what name did you use? Well, he had revealed himself to Moses in Deuteronomy, right? I'm the great I am, or Yahweh, or it got written Jehovah, or our English translation would say Lord in all caps. But did you know that if you were a true follower of God, you didn't even attempt what I just did? What did they say? They said they would come to that. My Hebrew professor would do this. He'd come to the name of God and he would say Hashem, which means the name. There's a certain hiddenness of God because we're just so not sure and we don't want to offend him in light of the commandment. So you would say, what's his name? Hashem, the name. But what happens here? We go, we're Christians. For, well, for, again, we were raised at least in Christian-influenced area. We go, oh, well, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the Christian God. Up until then, no one knew to call out to God as the triune Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus had been teaching and hinting, and now he puts it, go, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He says, here is how you pronounce the true name of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Is that important? You bet. Because we live in an age that says, God, you have your God, I have my God, or yeah, I believe in God. Jesus is saying there is a reality to know, and he wants us to deepen our knowledge of the true God. Come to the true God. It's an invitation to actually know God who is revealing himself, to know him deeply. And not just that, but a God who 
is not just showing up at the temple or those things, right? But as, as we love the phrase, I am with you always to the end of the age. As J.C. Ryle says, this God of grace, this God who has sacrificed, this God who comes and instills his Holy Spirit in us, tells us we are not orphan children in an unkind world. We are not deserted. Instead, we get to deepen our knowledge and experience in seeking our Lord. There's a clarity this is bringing to who God is. As Packer would say, there is an ability for us, J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God. We can know a lot about God and not know God. God is in the pattern of revealing himself that we might know him. Dan Postema writes this in his book, Space for God. The world really doesn't need more busy people. Maybe not even more intelligent people. It needs deep people people who know that they need solitude if they are going to find out who they are, silence if their words are to mean anything, reflection if their actions are to have any significance, contemplation if they are to see the world as it really is, prayer if they are to be conscious of the true triune God, if they are to know God and enjoy him forever. My final point here is that all mission flows out of a deep knowledge of God. And so Jesus' invitation here is to a deepening. How do you deepen your relationship with anyone? Do you just wait for them to show up? There does need to be some pursuit on our end. But it is an invitation because God has come first to pursue Imagine you got two invitations in the mail, one to like a boring office party that you knew the folks were going to be there and they'd never really been that hot, and one to a surprise party of your best friend. Which one would you jump at? Right? Which one are you excited about? These invitations Jesus offers us to realize, to join, to spread, and to deepen are to get us with an excitement. I don't know if I've done a well enough job to help capture some of that. But he doesn't just want us to hear a mandate, a duty. He wants us to go, this actually, these are things I long to be a part of. These are things I want. Help me step into my full humanity that you're calling me to, Lord. That we would realize his resurrection life for we are raised to life and life is actually found in longing to step into this invitation. Pray with me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, seeker of the lost, lover of souls, we give you glory and praise that you have sought us. May we deepen in relationship with you, that we would overflow to neighbor and nations. And all God's people saying, Amen. 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 I invite you to stand as we prepare to come to the table.
It is our time to gather around this table. This table spread for us by our authoritative Lord. Who ha- Thank you, John. Who has done all that is necessary. The Lord who embodied himself, lived the perfect life, died the death that we deserve to reconcile us, to make us friends with God after we had lost all authority, after we had given up on his cause, after we did not deserve to be brought back in. Jesus said, I have lost sheep, I will go get, and I will pay for them. And so we eat this meal because he gave it to us to remind us that his body was broken, that we might be brought back in, that his blood was shed, that we might be forgiven. And so he gave us this meal because he didn't want you to just hear my words. He wanted you to have another gate into your gut. (laughs) And that's the gate through your mouth, through your hands and touch, to remember that he came to be reminded that he loves you. If that is your faith, come eat with us. This is your table. This is your meal. If that is not yet your faith, we are so glad that you're here, but we know that folks are coming considering the claims and unsure of of, of Christ. And if that's the case, this is a meal of faith. And so we ask you, if you don't yet believe in Jesus, please, there's no shame in saying, I'm not sure yet, but don't eat this meal yet. Don't eat, because it's a meal of faith. And so if it doesn't represent your faith, we ask you not to eat. But again, whether we're eating in faith, whether we're considering and not yet eating in faith, this table displays the great love of God who comes for lost men and women. The Lord Jesus, I remind you, Paul writes, the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Join me in our response. Is the Father with us? Yes. Is Christ among us? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit here? Yes. This is our God, Father, Father, Son, and and Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. We are his people. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover, sacrifice for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Feed on Christ in your hearts with thanksgiving and drink, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this meal. We ask that these normal things, these, these difficult cups to get open, would not distract us, that you would feed our souls and be present here. In your name, amen. We're going to sing in a minute just the next two verses while we're distributing. I invite you to sing, but we will, uh, Mark and I will be coming around with uh, baskets. If you are taking the supper with us, this meal with us, hold out your hands as a sign of your emptiness filled by Christ, of your need for his sacrifice. We will put the little cups in it, and then when we're done with these two verses, we'll come back and eat together. Sing with us for now.
remind you if you just keep working it, if you're having trouble, you can ask for help from someone else, but keep working it back and the cellophane will finally pop and you can pull off the little wafer. Give a second for everyone to do that. <clears throat> Jesus says, in this bread, you're mine. I love you. Take, eat. And his blood poured out for the remission of sin. None remains. None is seen by him. All is covered by his blood. You are forgiven. He says to all of us, drink of it. All of you, drink. Let us stand together and sing the last two verses, making it a prayer, asking God to take this wonderful gospel to the nations. responses we embody these in this commissioning we do every week that with our first three we point to the cross to lay things there and then with our last response we point up we invite you to do that you don't have to do anything but we encourage you to join us if you'd like all our problems we send to the cross of Christ all our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ all the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ and all our hopes we set on the risen Christ. Stretch forth your hands. I invite you to stretch forth your hands and receive this good word. Think about this. I will use, if I get it right, the number six benediction. One not spoken over the nations when it was written. One only spoken over Israelites. And yet how many of us Gentiles now hear this blessing because of the gospel? So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Keep it simple. We'll have Dan send us out of here. As Christ burst forth from the tomb, may new life burst forth from us and show itself in acts of love and healing to a hurting world. Let us go forth as God's Easter people. You are dismissed. Happy Mother's Day again. <laughs>